Hello and welcome to the Orkney Storytelling Festival. This session is in Betty's Reading Room. You may be wondering why it's called Betty's Reading Room. It's after our friend Betty, who um, we all met in college uh, back in 68 and became good friends and just carried on being good friends through all of our life. And uh, got to know, well, we lived in London for 40 odd years and taught in London and then got to know Orkney in the 70s and loved it and kept coming back up here and eventually bought a house here. We had intended to retire here. Betty was going to retire to Orkney as well. Um, but unfortunately, uh, she had a very trivial, it was supposed to be surgical procedure, um, but she didn't survive it, um, which left a terrible gap in our lives. Um, and we were looking for a way to try and, it was supposed to be therapy for us, I think, and something that was a bit useful as well. And Jane came up with a brilliant idea. Well, when Betty died, it was like this big hole that we were sort of like tiptoeing around. And you thought, well, we need to do something. We need to make something good out of something bad that's happened. And we thought the best thing to do would be to set up a reading room because we knew of the reading room in Southwold, the sailor's reading room, and Betty absolutely loved books. And we just thought it'd be a good idea to, um, to have this place where anybody could come in and take a book, take it away with them, just sit down, read books, um, just really to sort of honor her memory. So with the aid of a lot of friends, um doing practical work or giving us things we managed to get this space together and fill it initially with our own books and now it's full of books that people bring as well um, under normal circumstances the doors never locked and we just like people to come in and sit and read sit and think sit and sleep if they want to um, we have various other things book groups use it for meetings and, and other groups um, people take away books they can keep them they can exchange them they can give them to friends, they can leave them in bus shelters, whatever they want to do, um, just so long as they take books and read them. That's the important, the central piece. And I suppose it's sort of a way of keeping Betty alive, really. Um, and sort of an, an added bit to it is that it's done us immense good because we have met so many wonderful people from all over the world. Hong Kong to Yeah, I mean, it's Honolulu. just unbelievable how they end up here. Um, and we've made good friends. And and we've quite missed this year not having any of them. Yeah, but we hope that we'll swing back into action next year. So if you're ever in Orkney, do come and see Betty's Reading Room. a story that's very close to my heart and I'd like to tell it for all the good spirits that ever came to Betty's reading room and for the good spirits of this land and the sea and especially for the spirits of those who are no longer walking this earth with us for Lawrence for Betty for Audrey. And once in the far, far north of Orkney, on the island that is called North Ronaldsay, there lived a young woman. And she was beautiful and she was strong. And many bachelors on the island were secretly in love with her. But she had no time for them. She was always busy. 
early in the morning before sunrise. She was out working with her two brothers in the fields. She helped her father with the fishing and her mother in the house. And every night at the same time, she had the food ready on the table for the whole family. But one day, there was no food on the table. The pot with the tatties, the potatoes, just stood by the fire. The tatties were not boiled. There was no water in the pot and she wasn't there. And that was so strange. She usually was like clockwork. So the father went down to the shore to look where she would be, because that's where she went every night with her bucket to fetch salt water from the sea to boil the tatties in. You see, salt was very expensive in those days. And it must have been a very low tide on that day, because the father had to walk a long way through the ebb, that stretch of no man's land between the marks of the high tide and the low tide. And there, by the water, he found her bu bucket, but it was empty, and she was nowhere to be seen. And soon, the whole island was out and about, calling her name and looking in every house and every byre and every field along the whole shore. But no one could find her. And when the, the night passed and the next day and then another week, a dark cloud of sadness lowered itself on this island. Because in such a small place, if just one person goes, it changes everything. But the years went by as they always do. And one day, the sun was high up in the sky. There was no cloud to be seen. The sea was blue and smooth as a mirror. It was a perfect day for fishing. So the father and the two brothers of the girl took their little boat out to sea. But as so often happens on a bright, sunny summer's day in Orkney, the har, the white nothing, comes rolling from the east across the North Sea. And in no time, the little boat and the men were wrapped in the white nothing. They couldn't see their hand in front of their eyes. So what could they do? They tried to stay put so their little boat wouldn't be carried away with the currents and crash on a rock hidden under the sea and they would drown. But after a while, they heard the scraping sound of pebbles under the floor of their boat. And the youngest of the brothers, who was the bravest, tested with his foot he put one foot out of the boat and he could feel stones under his boot. And so he took out the second foot and as soon as he stood on the stones, the fog disappeared as if it's been never been around. And then they saw they were on an island. And it looked a bit like Orkney with the rolling green hills and the cattle and the sheep in the fields. But the grass was much greener than they've ever seen before. 
and the cattle much bigger and shinier and fatter and redder than any cattle they knew from Orkney. And even the lambs were hopping much higher than their lambs at home. When they looked up in the sky, it was bright light, but there was no sun. So nothing and nobody on that island cast a shadow. When they looked up the hill, they saw a house. It was bright white and very big, almost like a castle. So they walked up to this house and knocked on the door. Someone must be home. They must be able to tell us where we are. And right enough, there, was foot, there were footsteps and the door opened and they stumbled backwards and they wanted to run. A ghost, a ghost. And then they stayed and they looked and they cried and they laughed. And there were hugs because no other than the long lost girl had opened the door. Where have you been? How did you get here? Her brothers asked. Are you well? Why did you never write? Asked her father. But the young woman just laughed her happy laughter as she always did. And she didn't look a day older than on, these, on this day many, many years ago when she had disappeared. Come in, she said. Come and sit down. The food is nearly ready. I'm just waiting for my husband and his brother to come home. Oh, she has a husband. So they sat for a while. And they talked about this and they talked about that when suddenly there was a strange smell in the air. It smelled a bit like fish, although no fish was cooking. And then the door burst open and a big ball of simmons of twisted heather ropes rolled in, unraveled, and disappeared to the back of the house. And soon after that, a tall, handsome man came in, wrapped in a black cloak. And that was the woman's brother-in-law. So they sat and talked again about this and about that, when the door burst open a second time. And another ball of Simmons rolled in, unraveled, and disappeared to the bend end, out of the back door. And then another tall, handsome man walked in, huddled in a black cloak. And that was the husband of the young woman. And now it was time to eat. But while they were eating, the brothers and the fathers exchanged glances because they had seen in whose company they were. Finn folk. The Finn men, they hide their fins under their black cloaks. And when you see their hands, there are webs between their fingers. And Finn men and the Finn folk, they live in crystal palaces under the waves in the winter. But in the summer, they live on islands that no human can see. And the Finn men, they like human wives because you see when they marry a mermaid that poor mermaid ages within seven years and gets old and wrinkly marriage does the mermaid no good the father and the brothers became restless they wanted to go home 
So the father turned to his daughter and said, Let's go. Let's go home. Mother, mother will be so happy to see you again. But the woman said, No. Even if I could, I would not come with you. Look around. How happy I am here with my husband and the beautiful cattle and sheep all around us. But you, you can always come and visit us. And she gave him a beautiful ivory knife with strange patterns carved into the ivory patterns that no human being had seen before. Now don't lose that knife. It's like a compass. It will always guide you back to where I am. And it's also for good luck, for the fishing. You will always have a good catch. So they walked back to their little boat and pushed it off the island. And as soon as the boat was out in the sea, the white fog came back and pushed them with soft fingers quickly, quickly back to their home island of North Ronaldsay. And when they came back to the house, the mother was already waiting and they had such wonderful news for her. Oh, you don't know who we met. And then the father reached into his pocket to show her the knife, but it wasn't there. And it wasn't in the other pocket. And it wasn't in the boat. And it wasn't on the path between the boat and the house. They never found that knife again. But now at least they knew that their daughter and sister was happy and healthy in the place where she lived. And the next time you come back to Orkney, go to the cliffs in the west and look across the Atlantic and find the spot where the sun sinks into the sea on a summer's evening. And only if you're lucky, you can see that island and it's floating upside down just above the horizon and it is called Heather Blether. Far as I have wandered Fortunes made and fortunes squandered So many friendships sundered And old loves gone before Still I find me yearning For that light by the high farms turning Where the lantern's burning For Michael on the moor Long the years since Michael Henty Soft me did implore To be his wife And share the life of Michael on the moor My Michael on the moor Tall and not quite handsome And high farm not quite a prince's ransom but master of his land, a man of not quite thirty-four. Me being but two and twenty, oh, I knew there'd be men aplenty, and younger men than Henty, old Michael on the moor. Long the years that I have travelled, men I've known full score and never yet a better met than Michael on the moor, young Michael on the moor. There are the maids and many, Michael might have chosen any, 
Even Squire's young Jenny with all her gold in store. Michael kissed them lightly, sent them all on their way politely. None but thee, said he to me, for Michael on the moor. And now I've searched the wide world round for what lay at my door. I rue the day I turned away for Michael on the moor, sweet Michael on the moor. Michael never married, no bride over that threshold carried, and never Charles Glad cried to try the silence of the moor. Michael died last summer, and High Farm sold on to some incomer, a stranger now behind the plough of Michael on the moor. And as I wept beside his grave, and Christ I wept full sore, I cursed the girlish pride that me denied the love so pure of my call on the This is a story about Orkney. It'll take us back in time at least 200 years. Now, of course, being an island group, Orkney is completely bound to the sea in, in all of its doings with trade and travel and comings and goings. Way back in time, before we had engines, people relied entirely on the power of the wind to fill their sails so that the boats would go wherever they needed them to go. And you were entirely at the mercy of the winds. If it was in the wrong direction or it was the wrong strength, then of course you had to adjust your journey accordingly and a lot depended on what the wind was doing. Now also at that time in Orkney, there were women who lived in most of the parishes and most of the villages around Orkney who were known as wise women. And a wise woman was exactly that. She knew things that other people didn't know. She would be particularly good at herbal remedies, maybe a love potion here and there. But some of these wise women were particularly skilled at controlling the elements, the storms, the wind, the rain. And they were very much in demand by sailors who needed a particular wind to get their ship to go where they needed to go. So they would approach these wise women and they would ask them, could we possibly buy a fair wind for our journey? And the women, for a small amount of money, were usually happy to oblige. Now, one of these wise women lived in Stromness and she was called Matty Black and she had a fearsome reputation for being able to control the winds and she was the one that everybody went to if they needed a fair wind for their journey. So on this particular occasion, there were three men. They were from Caithness in the north of Scotland. There was a man and his two sons and they were fisher folk. So they set off for a couple of days fishing in and around the north of Scotland. And it was their intention that they would sail across the Pentland Firth, taking whatever fish there were, spend a night in Stromness before making their journey back to Caithness. The journey went well, fish were, were caught and a good haul was had, and they arrived as they had intended in Stromness. But the weather forecast was not fantastic. And it was said that the, the wind was going to drop away and that it would be a few days before they would be able to travel again. Now, the two lads had particular concern about this because they both had young lassies 
who were waiting for them on the other side of the, the Pentland Firth. And they'd promised them ribbons for their hair and, and little gifts. So they were very keen to get back home to see their, their little lasses. So when they arrived in Stromness, father was away conducting some business, going to see the Chandler about something. The two boys decided to take matters into their own hands and they went to consult with the wise woman, Matty Black. And they said, we need a, a strong wind for our journey tomorrow. We want to get back to Caithness as soon as possible. Please, Matty. Well, for a small fee, gentlemen, I would be able to assist you with that. And they said, yes, please, what do we need to do? And she presented them with three pieces of straw. And each piece of straw had a thread tied to it. One of them had a green thread. One of them had a white thread. And the third one had a red thread. And she said, this is all you need, gentlemen, for a good strong wind to get you back home again. Oh, they were absolutely delighted. And she said, well, caution is advised. You must use them properly. When you set off from the harbour in Stromness, there won't be very much of a wind. So all you need to do is take the straw with the green thread and just throw it over the side of the boat. And you'll get a nice breeze that'll take you out of the harbour and set you off on your journey. But, she said, when you get to the island of Swona, the wind will drop away and your sails will hang listless. And that is when you need the second piece of straw with the white thread. And once again, it's very simple. All you need to do is just throw it over the side of the boat. You'll get a lovely strong wind and that'll push your sails and you'll be back in Caithness in no time. What about the third one, they said. What about the straw with the red thread? Oh, she said, don't use that one. Just in an extreme emergency, but if you can avoid it, don't use that one. It's very strong. Well, the night went as planned and in the morning at the crack of dawn, the three men, father and the two sons, set off on their journey and exactly as Matty had predicted. There was little or no wind in Stromness. So, whilst father was untying a rope, out came the first piece of straw with the green thread over the side of the boat. And sure enough, the sail snapped. And before they knew it, they were being whisked away from Stromness and headed across the Pentland Firth. And again, exactly as Matty had predicted, as they approached the island of Swona, the wind dropped away to nothing. They were becalmed. The sails were just hanging listless. Well, father was doing his best to try and angle the sails, maybe to just catch a little bit of a breeze. And whilst he was occupied, out came the second piece of straw with the white thread over the side of the boat. Whoa! And almost as if from nowhere, a breeze, in fact, quite a strong wind, blew up and it filled the sails and whoosh, away they went. And within no time at all, the coast of Caithness was before them and they were approaching the harbour of home. Well, everything had gone splendidly and according to plan. And not only that, as they steered their boat into harbour, they could see up on the hillside the two lassies and they were running down the road eagerly and they could hear them smiling, laughing and smiling and, and waving. And the two boys were so excited. They jumped up in the boat and they waved and they waved and they called. And as they jumped up and down in the boat, the third piece of straw with the red thread fell to the bottom of the boat. <gasps> it was too late. Their father had seen it. And he picked it up and he, he knew, he knew exactly what he was looking at. And he said, I cannot believe my two sons that I've brought up to be God-fearing and Bible reading, that you would disgrace me in such a way as to consort with these, these women. A curse on them, a curse on all witches and, and all their spells. And he took the piece of straw and he threw it as hard as he could over the side of the boat into the water. And from nowhere, a huge great wind ripped through the harbour and it snapped the sails and it jolted the boat. 
The rope went out of the father's hand. All three men were thrown onto the floor of the boat as it shot out of the water right the way back, all the way across the Pentland Firth, all the way back to Stromness. Well, that story probably has a moral, but I am jiggered if I can figure out what it is. Oh, I lay in bed all lang this morning, heedless of me mother's scorning, turned and twisted all last night, and never closed an e. While who sighed a million stars were winking, Sleep it wouldn't have come for thinking Oh, the three small loving words My Willie said to me Willie's tall and Willie's bonny Willie has nae muckle money No, the silly matters When I can I know him will Still I think I'd better tarry Bide a wee afore I marry No, to Willie catches mair than partons in his grill Ah, me mither calls me young and silly, fair too young to marry Willie. Seventeen come Christmas Day to Willie's twenty-three. And that all he's ever saved us griven, wouldn't a gee the cat a living. All the work that Willie does is running after me. Willie's slow and Willie's lazy, Willie tax things all easy. Feather says he's nothing but a trow he ne'er do we. So I think I'd better cap by the we afford a marry. No to Willie catches mare than partons in his creel. There's a peedy croft among the heather, while he says we'll bide together, while he makes a living we his booty on his sea. There's a peedy goosey's feather bigot, stutely thatched and snugly rigged, waiting to be taken o'er by Willie and by me. Willie stands out hooned and whistles, Willie's fields are full of thistles, thistles never brought a body any milk or meal. So I think I'd better tarry, by the wee afore I marry, no till Willie catches mare than partons in his grill. Now near to where I'm sitting here in Betty's, there is an island called Gershie, and a man used to live there called Harold. Now Harold worked on the land and he also went to the sea to fish. And one day he was out fishing. It was midsummer, and the fish were biting and he carried on fishing. Now the time wore on, it grew late, Later than he was intending to be out, but it was midsummer, it was still light, it was fine, he was heading home, when he heard music. Now, where could that be coming from, he thought. So he headed towards it, it was the most beautiful, wonderful music. Now he came to a small island called Bori, the home of Bori, and a home is the name here for a small island. And this was just a small, uninhabited island, but the music was coming from there, and he could see dancers down on the shore, all dancing around, having a merry old time. So he put his boat into the far side of the home, not that far away, but he went in there out of sight. And he headed down to where the dancers were, and he saw dark shapes lying on the ground on the beach. So he went over to see what they were, and they were sealskins, empty sealskins. So he knew that this was the selkie folk, people who lived as seals, but could take their skin off at certain times of the tide and take human form again and dance for a night until the sun rose and they had to go back to the sea. Now he took one of the skins and he rolled it up and he headed back to his boat with it and he headed back from the shore a bit. The music carried on, although he couldn't see any musicians. He didn't know where the music came from. It must be magic, he thought. But he stayed out, and the dancers danced, but as soon as the sun appeared above the horizon, they ran back to their skins, pulled them on, and dived into the sea as seals again. 
all except for one figure, one solitary figure standing on the shore. So he put his boat back in and he went over to where the figure was. He could see that it was a woman standing back on, looking out to sea. He came up closer to her and the woman turned around and he gazed into a pair of eyes that he knew well but never expected to see again. Hello, son, she said. Mother, but how, how can this be you? You're dead. You've been dead for years. You drowned. I know, son, she said. But it is the fate of those who drowned to become selkies. And I live in the sea, but I can come ashore once a month when we have the dancing night. But give me back my skin, son. Let me go back to the sea. No, mother, he said. No, I can't do that. No, I lost you once. I don't want to lose you again. Son, she said, I have to return. I can't go back to the land. Please give me my skin. Well, the two of them argued back and forth, and eventually she said, I'll tell you what, son. If you come back here to this island next month on the same day when the dancing night is, I will show you the skin of the most beautiful woman among all the Selkie folk. She is a princess among the Selkie folk. I'll show you her skin and you will have her as your wife. As long as you keep that skin, she can't go back to the sea. She is tied to you. He agreed and sadly he handed the skin back to his mother and his mother went down to the shore, slipped the skin back on and dived into the water as a seal and swam away. Now a month passed and he came back to the island. He could hear the same beautiful music being played and he put his boat onto the other side of the island where it was out of sight and he carefully walked along the shore. His mother broke away from the rest of the dancers and walked over towards him and then she bent down and she placed her hand on a skin and then she turned around and walked away. He went over to where the skin was and he picked it up, rolled it up, he took it into his boat and he headed back towards Gershi. Now he hid the skin where the woman would never find it. And then he returned to the island and he could hear the music, but then it stopped. And all the Selkie folk went back to their skins, went back to the sea, all except for one woman. One beautiful young woman was searching frantically for her skin. And the man saw her, went over to her, fell in love with her. She was so beautiful. I have your skin, he said. Please give it back, she said. No, I can't do that. You must come and live with me and be my wife. Well, she wept and she pleaded, but he refused to give her back her skin. And so she went back to Gershi with him. Now, Harold was a good man. He was kind, he was considerate. And soon the Selkie woman, she fell in love with him too, and the two of them were married. And they had several children, and they were very happy together. But there was a sadness on the woman. And every night on the dancing night, once a month, she took ill. And she seemed to be wasting away. It was as though the Selkie Folk song was drawing the life force from her. Now she grew weaker and weaker. And she said to her husband, I know that I have lived for a long time in the sea. And my father was a king and, and we had gods. We had Odin and Thor and beautiful Freya. But you talk of a, a God that you worship and a life 
everlasting after death. And I would like to take that religion of yours because I feel that my life is drawing to an end and I don't want to be parted with you forever. I want us to be able to be together again. So Harold went and he fetched a priest and he had his wife christened. Now she grew weaker and weaker every night of the dancing night, the song of the Selkies drew the life force from her. And the one day she said to her husband, tonight is the dancing night, and tonight is the night that I shall die. I don't know whether or not the ritual that your priest performed had any effect on me. I only can find out if you take me back to the island tonight, wrap me in my sealskin and put me on the shore. And if it didn't work, then they will have the power to take me away. But if it has worked, then they won't be able to take me. And I will know then that me and you will be reunited one day. So, Sadly, he wrapped up his wife in her sealskin and he carried her down to the boat. He laid her in the bow and he rowed back over to the island. He carried her and placed her down on the shore. And then he went back to his boat and he rowed away out of sight. But he sat there all that night in the boat, the tears dropping onto the bottom of that boat. Now, around midnight, he heard a cry. The Selkie folk had come, and they had found her on the shore. And his heart ached even more than before. He didn't believe it was possible to feel more pain, but he did. And eventually, when the night was over, when the sun rose, he went back to the island and he went along the shore and there was his wife's body. And now she was dead. But the Selkie folk had no power to take her away. And on her face, there was a smile, a smile of contentment, a smile that seemed to say to Harold, we are parted now but it will not be forever. We watched the blitz from up here, said our nan. Oh God, here we go. My brother and me rolled our eyes and braced ourselves. The trouble with growing up in the 1970s was having to listen to old people going on and on about the war. Stood on this very spot, she said many times. It's because it's so high up, see, you get a great view right across London. Of course, then it was all barrage balloons and searchlights and waves of planes and the sky all red over in the east where the docks was on fire. It is high up, St Mary's Church, Walthamstow, one of the highest places in London after Hampstead Teeth. We'd gone up to see the fireworks because it was the day before bonfire night and every now and again a shower of green or yellow sparks would go up. But Nan was remembering much deadlier explosions from 30 odd years before. Winter 1940, and the worst of the Blitz. She was working then in the Abercorn Rooms, which was a posh restaurant up by Liverpool Street. It was a good job and handy, because Liverpool Street Station is only 20 minutes up the track from Walthamstow. She did the lunchtime shift, which meant she could be home for my dad at tea time. Now, you're probably thinking, hang on, all the kids was evacuated out of London during the Blitz, and you'd be right. Right at the start, they were all packed off with their gas masks and little brown paper labels pinned to their coats. But then nothing happened for ages. 
and loads of them came back. My dad came back from Glasgow. He was very small, very bullied and very homesick. Walter Plant, who lived up in the top flat, he never even went. He was too frightened and his mum said he was too delicate, so she didn't let him go. The other kids said he was a weed, not a plant. Alfred Greenwood nicknamed him Weedy Walter. Alfie Greenwood, he ran away to come back. The Greenwoods lived just across the road and down a bit from Manam. Alfie was evacuated to a farm somewhere and he hated it, even though the farmer was lovely and gave Alfie a sheepdog puppy and everything. But Alfie's dad was missing in a POW camp somewhere. And Alfie knew that his sick granddad and his mum and his twin baby sisters needed him at the age of 11 to man up and come back and be the man of the house. So one morning he put the puppy, who he called Spitfire, in his coat pocket and hopped on the milk train and came home. So on this particular afternoon, there they all were, Alfie Greenwood and my dad and Weedy Walter and a whole bunch of other boys, all playing on the big square tombstones just beside the church porch. The rest of the graveyard is fenced off, but those two big tombstones have stood there for two, three hundred years, the names and dates gradually wearing off by generations of kids playing on them. They were playing escape. The vicar had put an absolute ban on them digging any more tunnels after an unfortunate incident with some old bones. So now they were going over the imaginary fence of their imaginary camp. And Alfie was being the camp commandant. He had a, an old torch he'd nicked from his granddad and he was flashing it round like a searchlight. And the puppy, Spitfire, was barking and jumping all over him <laughs> like, a, like a, a rottweiler in training. And just then, Manan came along. Alfie Greenwood, you get down off there at once. She was five foot nothing with her shoes on, my Nan. But she was pretty scary when she was cross. And just then, she was cross. You put that torch out, she shouted. Have you heard of the blackout? Get down here right now. And then she saw my dad, Gerald. And she hoiked him out by the ear from the crowd of little kids. Alfie, she said, you are the oldest and you are supposed to be setting a good example. Ain't you know there's a raid started? She said, now you make sure these little ones get home and then get home yourself. Your poor mum, she said, she's got enough on her plate. So Alfie rounded up all the little kids and the dog and set off up the hill and my nan grabbed Walter by the ear with one hand and my dad by the ear with the other and frog marched them off down the hill home. Nan lived in the bottom of a tall house with a long, thin garden out the back. Walter and his mum, the plants, they lived up the top and Miss Buck lived in the middle and they all shared an Anderson shelter, a hump-backed, corrugated iron sort of shed down the bottom of the garden, past the wash house and the lavvy and the piles of mud that was supposed to be their attempt to dig for victory. It was dark by the time Nan got in and she knew that all the others would be in the shelter already. So she shoved the two boys towards the back door. You go get in the Anderson, she said. I'll be right along in a minute. And she ducked into the kitchen to fill a thermos with, with some tea and to get some bread and dripping for the boys. The air was already thrumming with the sound of aeroplane engines and the shrill, metallic bells of fire engines. And then it started boom, boom in the distance, the dropping of bombs. Whitechapel, Wapping, Clapton, it's coming nearer all the time. She just got the lid off the thermos when woof, <laughs> that was closer. The windows shook in their brown paper tapes and all the cups and saucers rattled in the dresser. Well, she stepped out into the garden and then she saw Gerald, my dad and Weedy Walter had not gone into the shelter. They were standing next to it. They'd climbed up on a big pile of sandbags and they were staring up into the sky, open mouthed, gazing at the searchlight beams crisscrossing and the planes weaving through them. You get inside, she shouted, and just at that moment, Bosh! There was a huge explosion, absolutely deafening, much closer, probably just across the road this time. Everything shook, Nan's ears popped, and as she tried to see where she was going, suddenly somebody else came crashing through the hedge, grabbed the two boys and hurled them onto the floor. And just at that second, the aftershock hit, and boom, fizz. The air was filled with grit and dust and smoke and stench and as she clawed her way through it with her ears popping and her chest crushed with the sense of the shockwave, she saw what had happened. This huge, jagged, smoking, stinking shard of steel, red hot shrapnel, had 
buried itself point down in the sandbags exactly where my dad and Weedy Walter had been standing just two seconds before. Meanwhile, just three feet away on the ground in the mud, there's a tangle of boots and shorts and legs and, well, boys, basically. Walter's mum sticks her arm out of the Anderson shelter door, grabs Walter by the seat of his shorts and hoiked him inside. And up out of the dust and the mud steps my dad and Alfie Greenwood. What are you doing here, said my nan. And then, you could have been killed. And the boys are going, cool. Because they're looking at the shrapnel. All the boys were collecting it. Nan had had enough. Get in there, she said, and shoved the pair of them into the Anderson and climbed in after them and banged the door. She plonked them down on the plank bench. Alfie, she said, what are you doing here? I sent you home. I couldn't get there, Mrs King, he said. The road's all blocked down our way. I couldn't get round the other way either by the high street. So I went along the railway embankment and climbed through your edge. Well, she said, it's lucky for us you did. That was a very lucky escape. All the boys were white as sheets and shaking and Alfie was covered in dust and his watch was broken. The face was cracked clean across and the hands stopped at five to eight. Outside, the raid was still going on. The ground's shaking, the air's swimming, and there's clattering bits of gravel coming down on the roof of the shelter every couple of seconds. You'd better stop with us here, said Nan, until it's over. Your poor mum will be worried sick. They'll have been in their shelter for hours. They don't go in there anymore, miss, said, said, said Alfie. But Grandad can't stand it. He says it reminds him of the song. So now they go in the understairs cupboard. Oh, well, you better step here anyway, said the Nan. And she poured out a cup of tea from the thermos, although her hands were shaking. So were Alpha's as he took it. He didn't drink it, but he held it because it's warm. And he was freezing cold and covered in pale dust. So Alpha held the tea, and my nan held my dad, and Mrs Plant held Walter, and over in the corner Mrs Buck held on to a half-empty bottle, fast asleep, mouth open, snoring. They had the tilly lamp lit, but it was still pretty gloomy and cold in there, and difficult to keep your feet out of the puddles on the floor. Night after night after night they took that. All was tired, all was scared, tired of being scared. I must have dozed off in the end because my nan woke up suddenly and it was dawn. Outside the sky was grey and smoky and stinky. Everybody got out stiff and headed for the loo. When she opened the thick blackout curtains on the front living room window, she could see there was a commotion going on halfway down the road, so she went out to have a look. And halfway down the road, there was this great, huge, gaping crater where the road should have been. And a great, huge pile of bricks and rubble where a house should have been. Just one wall still standing with shreds of wallpaper and shreds of curtains flapping in the wind like the house had been turned inside out. That's the Greenwood house, she said. Oh my God, they was in there. Get them out, get them out. There's already a team of volunteers and wardens clambering over the bricks and rubble, heading for where the garden should have been to start digging for the shelter. And then suddenly Nan remembered. They're not in there, she said. They're not in the shelter. Dig under the stairs. She grabbed hold of a warden and shook him by the arm till she was sure he was listening to her. They're under the stairs, she said. Dig under the stairs. Eight hours they were digging. Eight hours of back-breaking brick shifting. It was gone tea time by the time they found the staircase and even then they couldn't get to the door. But they knew somebody was alive in there because they could hear someone tapping, although it was getting fainter. It was nearly tea time by the time they got them out and the sirens were going again. They had to prise the treads off the stairs and go in that way. Old Grandad Greenwood came out first, clutching a broken nose and cursing the Jerrys. And then the little twins clutching each other and Lily Greenwood clutching them still and sort of silent and staring. And last of all came Alfie Greenwood. They found him right down in the corner, furthest under and under the stairs. And he was still and white and stiff. His watch stopped. It seemed that Alfie and his watch had stopped at five to eight. Well, thank God you knew where to dig, eh, Peggy, said the warden to Manan. We'd have been digging all day in the garden. We'd never have found them and they wouldn't have lasted another night. Nan felt dizzy, like the night before when the shockwave hit. How could she explain to anybody that a boy had been in her garden and had saved my dad and... Willie Walter from, from the shrapnel at the same time as being under the stairs in his own house when the same bomb fell. Just then, 
there was a sort of whining, a whining sort of noise, and, and Alfie seemed to be wriggling. And out of his pocket came the little puppy, Spitfire. They'd laid him on a stretcher on the rubble, and the puppy sort of climbed up onto him and started licking his face and yapping. Poor little bleeder, said the warden. Nan never knew if he meant the dog or Alfie, because at that moment Alfie coughed up a whole load of brick dust and opened his eyes. Blimey, he's alive, shouted someone. Someone go and tell his mum, quick. Whoa, little Houdini, eh? A few people started clapping in a tired, weary sort of way. What a lucky escape, eh? Years and years later, standing in the churchyard, watching the Guy Fawkes fireworks going up over Walthamstow, Nan offered no explanation at all as to how Alfie had been in two places at once. She didn't hold with the supernatural. She only believed in God on the strict circumstance that he was strictly C of E and didn't do any actual miracles. He saved six lives that night, she said, if you count them up. A lot of crazy things happen in a war, said Nan. Well, war is crazy, isn't it? And you can't argue with that. The lads in their hundreds to Ludlow come in for the fair. There's lads from the barn and the forge and the mill and the fold. The lads for the girls and the lads for the liquor and there. And there with the rest are the lads who will never be old. There's chaps from the town and the field and the till and the cart. And many to count are the stalwart, and many the brave, and many the handsome of face and the handsome of heart, and few that will carry their looks or their truth to the grave. I wish one could know them, I wish there were tokens to tell, those fortunate fellows that now one can never discern and that one could talk with them friendly and wish them farewell and watch them depart on the road that they will not return stare all you like but there's nothing to scan nor brushing your elbows unlooked for there's naught to be told they carry back bright to the coiner the mintage of man those lads who will die in their glory and will never be old the lads in their hundreds to Ludlow come in for the fair there's lads from the barn and the forge and the mill and the fold. The lads for the girls and the lads for the liquor. And there, and there with the rest are the lads who will never be old. Young love, isn't it the most wonderful feeling in the whole world? Oh, the butterflies in the stomach and the gazing into each other's eyes. And, oh, the heartache when the lovers have to spend time away from each other. And once in old China, there was a young couple. They were just married and the husband was so in love with his wife that he couldn't stop looking at her. Oh, the beauty of her and the way she moved. So besotted he was that it was impossible for him to go to work. He had to stay home. He had to be by her side. 
but Earth is the way of the world. No work, no money, no money, no food. But ah, what do you need fancy sweets for and meat and fish anyway? And also, the wife had brought a good dowry to the marriage. So when they ran out of money the first time around, they just sold her jewelry. And when all that was gone, well, there was still the antique furniture the wife had inherited from her parents. But after a while, there came the day when there wasn't even a coin left in the house. And with a heavy heart, the young man kissed his wife goodbye and walked out of the house through the village into the rice fields where his work was. But while he was walking, his steps got slower and slower and his mind was whirling from the thoughts and the worries that plagued him. What if my beautiful wife goes out in the garden and people from the village walk by and they can see her and they look at her? Or worse still, if there's a man, a stranger, a wanderer who looks at her and then she will look at him and they might go away together and leave me all by myself. So sad he became that he didn't even notice that he wasn't alone. Next to him, there was an old man walking. He wasn't very tall. He maybe reached up to the young man's shoulder and he had a long white beard and piercing green eyes. And he spoke to the young man. You know, you look so, so unhappy. I think I have something that will help you. How do you know that? said the young man. Ugh. I know a lot of things, the old man said, and he got out of his pocket a small bottle. Here, young man, take this bottle and all your worries will be over. What? How? Well, just do as you're told. In the morning, before you say goodbye to your wife, just look at her and then blow over the bottle like this. And in the evening, you just do the same. And I promise you, all will be fine. Here, have this bottle. I give it to you for free. Well, it was worth a try. So the next morning, the man, the young man, said, did how he was, what he was told. He got up, he looked at his wife, he took the bottle and he blew over it. And then something strange happened. The wife got smaller and smaller and smaller until she was so small that she was in the bottle. And the man put the bottle in his pocket and went to work. And that was wonderful. For weeks and weeks and weeks, he could take his wife with him and they were not apart from each other. But one evening when they got home and she had stepped out of the bottle, she looked very grumpy. What's wrong? the husband asked. What's wrong? Just look around in this house. Every time we get home, 
It is dark and none of the housework is done. The dust is dancing around our noses. Haven't you noticed? There is no clean dish left anymore. And the piles of washing, the dirty laundry, is just everywhere. Because you see, in those days, the only way to wash the laundry was to go to the village pond. And you can't do this after dark. It's not possible. So, with a heavy heart, the husband had to give his wife a day off to do the washing. And sad and downcast, he went to work on that day. But she was busy. She picked up all the dirty laundry that was all over the house and took it to the village pond. And as you do before you put your washing in the water, you check every pocket to see if there's something in there that shouldn't get wet. And when she picked up an old minging coat of her husband's, she felt something hard in the pocket. It was the bottle. That stupid bottle she hated more from day to day. The bottle she had to sit in every day, all day. And in the first instance, she felt like flinging it as far as possible into the village pond. But then she thought, oh, how would I explain this to my husband? And while she stood by the water with the bottle in her hand, there was a movement at the far end of the pond. There was a bridge crossing the pond, and over that bridge walked a young man. A handsome young man. And the woman took the bottle, she looked at the young man, and she blew. And the young man was in the bottle. She finished all her washing, but didn't wash the old minging jacket, put the bottle with the young man back in the pocket, and walked home. In the evening, her husband came rushing back from work and he was glad to see his old stinky jacket still hanging on the, on the hook on the wall. And he felt the pocket. Oh yes, the bottle was still there. And none of them, not the wife, not the husband, mentioned anything about that jacket or let alone the bottle. And the next morning, it was back to business as usual. Look at the wife, blow across the bottle, wife in the bottle, wife in the pocket, off to work. And when they came back that evening, the wife stepped out of the bottle with a big smile on her face. And so the three of them lived many, many, many years very happily. The husband, the wife, and the young man in the bottle. Only sometimes the husband wondered why his wife always came out of the bottle with such a beaming smile on her face. Now, my mother came from Westry, and this is a story from that island. And it's a story that I had from her, and uh, it, it's well known, but it does have a little ending that is personal to my uh, family. Now, 
A long time ago in the 1730s, there was a storm raging on Westry, and the woman at Sequoy was sitting by the fire doing some mending, and the door opened and in came her husband. And he said, there's a big sailing ship hidden towards the rocks. I'm going to go next door and get chalk of wheeling stains, and we're going to go down and see if we can save any of the people on board. Well, be careful, she said. It's no a night to be out on. Oh, I know that, he says. Don't you worry. So he went and got the neighbours, and they went down to the shore, and sure enough, there was a big three-masted ship being driven by the wind towards the rocks. Its sails were tattered. One of the masts was broken. And on board the ship, there was great panic, because all the people on board knew that their time had come. This was the end for most, if not all of them. But there was nothing that they could do to bring that ship under control, to get it away from the rocks. There was nothing that the Westry folk could do to help either. There was no way you could put a boat on that weather. Now on the boat, on the ship, there was a woman. And people said it was the captain's wife. But how they knew that, well, no one knows who she was really. But there was a woman on board and she had a boy, a wee son. And she took the son and she tied him tight to her with a shawl. And then just before the ship struck the rocks, she wrapped her arms around the boy and she chomped over the side of the ship into the foaming, raging sea. The rocks tore the side out of the ship and she was broken into matchsticks. Pieces of it was driven ashore. There was nothing that the folk could do to save any of the crew. It was too far out. So after a while they went home. Now when the sun rose the next day they went back to the shore to collect up anything that they could use. I mean one person's disaster was another person's good luck in those days. And in an island where there's no wood, no timber, any pieces of wood is valuable. Now, there was also the cargo as well, whatever was washed ashore. And it could be the difference in a time before any social care that could make the difference between an old person or a, a small child or somebody who wasn't well making it through a winter or dying. So they went down to the shore and they were gathering up what they could find, pieces of wood, sailcloth, ropes, barrels from the cargo. And every now and again they would find the body of a sailor lying dead on the shore. And they would pull them up to bury them later, give them a decent burial. Now the man of Sequoi was down there searching as well, and as he walked along the shore, he saw a body lying on the sand. And he went over to it, and it was a woman. And he thought, it's a terrible thing to see. And then he looked closer, and he could see that tied to her breast, in a shawl, was a baby. Well... He thought that this was a terrible thing, poor wee soul. But then the baby made a slight cry, and he could see that it was still alive. So he untied the shawl, he took the baby, and he ran home with it as fast as he could go to his wife. He gave the wee boy to her. She dried him off and wrapped him up in a warm blanket by the side of the fire, she warmed up some milk and she fed it to the boy. And he was fine. And he survived. And he grew up to be a fine, strong young man. But nobody knew anything about him. Nobody knew where he came from or what his name was or anything. The only clue was that there was a piece of wood washed ashore that had writing on it. Now the man of Sequoia had found this. But he couldn't read. So he took it to the minister. And the minister looked at it and he said, 
It says Archangel. It must be the port of registration for the vessel. It must have been a Russian ship. And so the boy got his name from Archangel. They called him Archie Angel. And he grew up, married, and had a family of his own, all called Angel, of course. And there was angels in Westry for over a hundred years, 150 years, that name carried on. Now, there was lots of angels in Westry, and my mother always said that all people from Westry were angels, but I suspect she was biased. But she told me a story that tacks on to the end of that one about my own family. You see, my parents were of old enough to have known better, as I always say, uh, when I was born, because my father was 52 and my mother was 41 when I was born. So he was born in Sandy in 1911, and my mother was born in Westry in 1922. Now, my grandparents were born in the 1880s, and my mother's father, Jordi Draver, was a crofter and a fisherman out in Westry. And when he was a boy, he was at school with another young lad called Henry Mason. Now, Henry Mason was the son of Mary Angel. And Mary Angel was the last person to bear the name of Angel in Westry. There was a lot of daughters in the family, so the name disappeared. Now, at that time, there was a school teacher the headmaster of the school that they were at. And he was very, very, very strict. And if any kids did anything wrong, the whole lot of them were kept back in detention. And they were given sums to do. And in those days, it was the old slates, a slate pencil, and they were all squeaking away on that. The right way. And they could hear a mutter, mutter, mutter coming up the close. And the door opened and in came Mary Angel. And my mother always described Mary as being a coarse set like Buddy. I always had this mental picture of her looking like Boris Yeltsin in a headscarf and pinny. But in came Mary and she said, wash me boy. And the teacher says, well, they have misbehaved. So they are being kept back. And she said, well, his tea's ready. And she went to get the boy. Now, the teacher, despite being an educated man, made a very, very simple mistake because everybody knows that you do not get between a wild animal and its young. But he stood between her and her son where she just up with her fist and smacked the teacher and down he went. But that wasn't enough for Mary. She got him by the scruff of the neck and she beat his head off the floor until she knocked him unconscious, grabbed her boy by the arm, pulled him out the door, slammed the door. Well, the kids were horrified. Oh, my God, Mary Angel's killed the teacher. What sort of a detention will we get for that? They had images of themselves as old men with long flowing beards still doing long division. But one of the braver ones went over and got a wee bit of water and splashed on the teacher's face, and the teacher opened his eyes. And then he said in a rather a feeble voice, he said, get me a glass of water, boys. So they fetched him a glass of water and he had a drink. And then he said, class dismissed. Well, they didn't need to take a second telling. They were out that door like a shot. Now, after that, Mary Angel became a bit of a hero with the kids around Skillow in Westry because it was said that after that, the teacher never kept any of the kids back in detention again. Oh, come all you jovial women, come listen to my song. It is a little ditty and it won't contain you long. It's of a fair young damsel, oh, she lived down in Kent. Awoke one summer morning and she a nutting went with my fowl out and your own fowl out. Whack for the dear old day and what food as that poor girl had she threw them all away. 
It's of a brisk young ploughman was a ploughing of his land. He called unto his horses to bid them gently stand. As he sat down upon his plough, all for a song to sing. His voice was so melodious, it made the valleys ring. With my foul low, did he row foul low? Whack for the dear old day. And what foon as that poor girl lad, she threw them all away. She then comes to young Johnny as he sits on his plough. Says she, young man, I really feel I cannot tell you how. He took her to some shady brew and there he laid her down. Says she, young man, I think I feel the world go round and round. With my foul loud, did you bow foul loud? Whack for the dear old day. And what foon a sad poor girl had she threw them all away. So come all ye jovial women, this warning by me take. If you should a nut and go, don't stay out too late. For if you should stay too late, for to hear the ploughboy sing. You might have a young farmer to nurse up in the spring. With my foul low, did he row foul low? Whack for the dear old day. And what foon as that poor girl had she threw them all away. This story was told to me by a very good friend of mine. And this friend is particularly fond of the old ways, the old days, the old words. And I think if he could have been born a hundred years ago, he would have been very happy indeed. But this is a story he told me. And it's about three old men, three old Orkney men. And they had known each other since they were tiny children, grown up together, went to school together, lived in the same place together, known each other their whole lives and had been fast friends all that time. But there was always a little edge of competition. There was always a, a bit of trying to kind of top one another. If one of them had a story, one of them had a better story. And this friendly rivalry had gone on for decades. And when they were really quite old men, they would sit and they would reminisce and they would talk about the old times. And as they were sitting around chewing the fat and having a wee smoke of a pipe, one of them said, do you know, boys, it's amazing. After all these years, I've still got a memory that's just as just sharp as a pin. I can remember so far back. I can remember to my childhood. And the, the other two were, well, yes, yes, oh, me too. I've got a very good memory as well. You know, oh, yes, I can remember all that time ago. And one of them said, do you know, boys, it's just occurred to me that I've got a memory that's so good, I can remember that far back that I can remember my first birthday. Oh, <gasps> what, said the other two? Really? You, you can remember your first birthday? Yep, he said. I have this distinct memory of being in my high chair and it was a wooden one. And I remember my mother coming in and she had a, a plate and it had a, a slice of cake and a a candle on the top, just a single candle. And that was my first birthday. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. Oh, <gasps> well, said the other two. That is very impressive. Now, of course, this set the other two off thinking, hmm, well, that's quite impressive. I wonder if I can remember. Oh, <gasps> the second one said, hold on, boys. Hold on. I think I can top that. I've got a very good memory. I can remember so far back, he says, you're not going to believe this, but I can remember so far back, I can remember being born. <gasps> what? Said the other two. What? You can remember being born? He says, yes. He says, I know you're not going to believe this. He says, but I just have this memory of being in this lovely warm place. And suddenly there was this, this great rush of air. And it was all, it was, 
suddenly I shot out and he says, and the doctor caught me before I hit the floor. What? Said the other two. This is not possible. Surely you can't remember. He says, I swear, I swear, this is absolutely true. I swear to God, I can remember being born. Oh, <gasps> well, very impressive. Hmm. And the three of them sat and had a suck of their pipes and there was a silence. And then the third one said, oh, I've got it, boys. I've got it. He says, two of you, pretty impressive. Being able to remember your first birthday, that's good. Being, being able to remember being bored, that's even more impressive. He says, but I've got you. I can remember even further back than that. And the two of the earth looked at each other and they looked at him and they said, what? What are you talking about, man? And he says, I can, I've got that good a memory. I can remember so far back, I swear to God, that I can remember going to a dance with my father and coming home with my mother. Mm -hmm.